It's an extraordinary honor to introduce my colleague, Carol Cornwall Madsen. I don't know whether you know, but uh, Carol began her career as a historian and lecturer rather late in life. But despite that, uh, that timing, she has an extraordinary record of achievement. She has recently retired as professor of history here at BYU and as a senior research historian at the Joseph Fielding Smith Institute for Church History. For three years, she served as an associate director of the Women's uh, Research Institute here at BYU, and in the process of that assignment, co-edited two important volumes dealing with uh, LDS women's history. She is the author of over four dozen articles, important articles. She has also uh, authored or edited five books, most recently, Battle for the Ballot, Women's Suffrage in Utah, and another volume, uh, uh, Journey to Zion, Voices on the Mormon Trail. She has a forthcoming volume that uh, will soon be uh, out, uh, dealing with the suffrage activities of Emmeline B. Wells. Uh, Sister Madsen is also uh, in work uh, with an extremely important biography uh, on uh, Emmeline B. Wells. Dr. Madsen is married to Gordon uh, Madsen, uh, Salt Lake attorney. They are the parents of six children and six grandchildren. And incidentally, several of those children over the years have intersected with my own children. We are close family friends. On a personal level, if I were to uh, describe Carol, I would use some adjectives. As I drove down to the university uh, this morning, um, I gave some thought about what adjectives might describe her. She's honest. She is committed. She is engaging and she's gracious. She's unfailingly polite and decent. She's not only hardworking, but extremely talented, not only as a lecturer, but as a craftsman. Each one of those uh, words or phrases deserves some paragraphs. But suffice it to say, uh, Carol has earned uh, the respect of her closest friends and associates um, who regard her professionally and personally as uh, with great affection and appreciation. So again, it is my honor to uh, introduce my close friend and colleague, Carol Cornwall Madsen. Thank you very much, Ron. We do have a wonderful association in the Smith Institute. We are all sharing the same interests and sit the same work, and we become very close in, in that association and in our endeavors. I want you to know how much an, of an honor I feel it is to have been selected to, to be this year's lecture for the Alice Louise Reynolds Lecture Series. Some years ago, I did a study of Alice Louise Reynolds and those Alice Louise Reynolds clubs that a number of her students organized in her name to perpetuate uh, the work that she had done for them when they attended school here at BYU. And it was a, a great introduction to a great woman. And she has certainly left a wonderful tradition for all of the women faculty here at Brigham Young University. And I also want to thank Russ Taylor and uh, Jenny, I've gone blank, <laughs> Jenny Reeder, I'm sorry, I just, I know her very well, Jenny Reeder for having done this beautiful display and I do encourage all of you to go and see it. Uh, the library holds some wonderful documents about Emmeline Wells as well as pictures and other things that I think will help you understand the life of this woman that we're going to be talking about this afternoon.
One meditative day in 1888, the 60-year-old Emmeline Wells recalled an epiphany she experienced as a young girl while looking over some old papers and letters in the attic of her rural Massachusetts home. A light had dawned upon me in that out-of-the-way place she remembered. I had found out that women sometimes put their thoughts upon paper, and I conceived the idea of making rhymes or jingles. The young, curious New England girl grew into a woman who wrote much more than rhymes or jingles. The poetry she came to write far exceeded that level of expression, and her articles and editorials for The Woman's Exponent, the Mormon woman's newspaper she edited, the short stories she published in church magazines, the innumerable letters she wrote over her lifetime, the comprehensive Relief Society minutes she kept as general secretary, and the incomparable diaries that cover most of her life give evidence of a gifted and compulsive writer of substance and merit. She was literally never at a loss for words. She once described an author's mind. It resembles, she wrote, not an empty tenement, but a barn stored to bursting. It is a painful pressure constraining to write, perhaps involuntarily, memory, imagination, zeal, perceptions of men and things, a crowd of internal imagery, and we write to be quit of them and not let the crowd increase. A clue to when she found time to leave such a voluminous written legacy, given the kinetic life she lived, is found in a letter to her friend and co-worker, Susie Young Gates. I am going to do lots of writing yet tonight, she wrote, and even now the clock is striking the midnight hour. This is my best time, you know, and at Waterloo, the neighborhood where she lived in Salt Lake, all is quiet not a sound save the dogs baying at the moon. That only the night gave her the precious writing time she craved is confirmed by the numerous diary entries which tell of these midnight rendezvous with paper and pen. Her interest in writing did not end with her own ambitions. She created opportunities for other women to develop latent literary talents and to publish their pieces not only in The Woman's Exponent, but in other publications as well. The two literary clubs she organized, the Reapers and the Utah Woman's Press Club, provided a number of local women an incentive to formulate their ideas in publishable form. Public writing was a vocation that continued to carry overtones of female impropriety even late in the 19th century and some women still hesitated to enter the field. That there were women, quote, willing to produce in writing a witness of their mind's individuality, despite these residual restraints, pleased Emmeline immensely. I can see no good, sound, wholesome reason, she argued, against women's writing upon any of the general topics of the day. She may be a profound thinker, but if her ideas never assume any form, what will it avail? She was ever the woman's advocate for freedom of expression. Although Emmeline Wells hoped that poetry would be the means of fulfilling her literary ambitions, destiny decreed otherwise. Her early contributions to the woman's exponent, founded in 1872, led to a permanent position with the newspaper, first as associate editor and then in 1877 as editor, a post she held for 37 of its 42-year history. She managed to produce a volume of poetry during those years, but her editorials and articles in The Exponent had far more impact and permanence, while giving her the recognition promised in her youth when she was called a child of destiny. Certainly, she must have felt tremendous personal satisfaction when she was awarded an honorary Doctor of Literature degree from Brigham Young University in 1912, only the second honoree in 23 years and the first woman, and actually the only woman honored at this institution for 42 years thereafter. 
In her public work, Emmeline spoke with two voices, the sentimental Aunt Em and the feminist Blanche Beechwood, the pseudonym she used before becoming editor of The Exponent. This literary dichotomy replicated that of her private and public worlds, which were hyphenated rather than disconnected from one another. She was at once a very private and a very public person, a devoted, almost obsessive family woman and a driven, ambitious professional, a poet of sentiment and nostalgia and a strong-minded woman's advocate, a thinker and a doer. Her personal appearance also reflected this duality. She was exceedingly dainty and delicate, barely reaching five feet or a hundred pounds. She wore increasingly quaint clothes and favored rings and earrings, particularly amethyst. But this little, delicate, great-minded person, as one friend described her, would walk softly, yet with fierce independence, into a room. The vision she presented of ethereal delicacy and angelic sweetness and grace, as the Deseret News once observed, often cloaked a manner that sometimes evoked epithets such as strong-minded, domineering, sarcastic, and even caustic in her desire to get things done. The characterization made of her at her death was probably quite accurate. Quote, she was as unyielding as the granite of her native New England in her devotion to that which she considered her duty. A relative once accompanied her to a gathering of prominent Eastern women in the Plaza Hotel in New York City, a bit embarrassed because of Emmeline's old-fashioned attire but before the important business meeting adjourned, the relative noted that the oddly attired Emmeline was the figure of attention, the one who knew all the rules of order and the proper procedure. It is not hard to envision Emmeline Wells quickly taking charge in any situation she felt lacked leadership. That which she considered her duty was a lifelong determination to aid the people of her faith. She began this venture during a volatile period in Mormon history. At the time she joined the woman's exponent, the animosity toward the Mormons had moved from the local skirmishes that had driven them out of Ohio, Missouri, and Illinois to a national crusade involving nationwide women's reform organizations and the federal government. In 1878, she responded to the challenge this protracted struggle promised with a declaration of intent. I desire to do all in my power to elevate the condition of my people, especially women. Her success in this role resulted from her ability to use the power of her pen and personality to create a relationship of conciliation with the hostile world and to establish a broad consensus of goodwill and respect toward her fellow Mormons, to correct the misrepresentation of her people, and to bridge the chasm of intolerance that had isolated the women of her faith consumed her adult life. The task of mediation could have found no more capable advocate. One appreciative admirer wrote, quote, the women of Utah should be ever grateful to Mrs. E.B. Wells for the glorious work she does and instigates in the interest of woman. She is doing the work of a veritable Apostle Paul, and she occupies the difficult role of mediator between the different factions of women's interests. On her 82nd birthday, she was lauded for having, quote, traveled tens of thousands of miles to render service in defense of her church and her sex. And she enjoys the respect, in many instances, the intimate acquaintance and affection of the leading women, not only of America, but of the world. When she died, her funeral was held in the tabernacle, only the second woman so privileged. The New York Times ran an obituary and thousands passed her beer while the city's flags were flown at half-mast. 
She was remembered as having been, quote, known and beloved to a degree and with a universality that has fallen to the lot of few of her sex in this or any other country or time. Yet this highly acclaimed woman is little known in the church today. This is a surprising fact since so much was written about her in her time, biographical sketches filling both LDS and non-Mormon publications. Even more significant is the large written legacy Emmeline Wells left of her own. The woman's exponent is only one avenue to her agile and perceptive mind. Her numerous other writings also help one discover something of her thoughts and motivations. Of all the words she left, however, her 47 diaries, all housed in the Harold B. Lee Library, serve as the fixed point of reference to her life the nucleus of all her written expressions. They, most of all, help to unlock the heart and mind of the private woman and reveal the thoughts and experiences that motivated her to become the public advocate for which she was so highly honored. One cannot read a diary and feel unacquainted with its writer, literary critic Thomas Mallon once wrote, diaries, he said, are the flesh made word. Yet with all of these pieces of insight and information, the challenge in reaching the soul of this woman is fitting them together into a cohesive and discernible whole. When I first became acquainted with her through the woman's exponent more than 25 years ago, I began my own quest to try to weave a coherent pattern from the varied strands of her life but I was daunted by the task of trying to reduce this extraordinary woman's life to words, my words, when she left so many of her own. Moreover, another caution has continually hovered close in this attempt. Emmeline Wells herself left a challenge to all of her would-be biographers or to any other writer who attempts to capture the life of someone th through the prism of his or her own understanding. How utterly unable we are to judge one another, none of us being constituted exactly alike, Emmeline wrote toward the beginning of her own writing career. How can we define each other's sentiments truly? How discriminate fairly and justly in those peculiarly nice points of distinction, which are determined by the emotions agitating the human heart in its variety of phases, or under perhaps exceptional circumstances. I cannot easily dismiss this cautionary question as I attempt to bring this woman's life to a generation that knows so little about her. The thousands of words she left behind, however, in all their variety of forms, and all handwritten, she disdained the typewriter, disclose how consistently she adhered to the adage, look within yourself and write what you find there. All of her writing, both personal and public, are evocations of her thoughts, emotions, feelings, and her experiences. They are more than just chronicles. They vibrate with life, emotion, and a palpable sense of immediacy. When she embarked on a long, serialized, and romanticized account of her own early life under the title Hepzibah, a story she said she felt constrained to write, she hoped it would be the creditable book she longed to produce. Only through the pages of The Woman's Exponent, however, did it reach an audience. The first of 28 chapters appeared in the June 1889 issue and the last in September, 1890. With altered names, including her own, it reveals her retrospective view of her New England childhood and the dramatic events of her brief stay in Nauvoo. Writing it was an emotionally taxing commitment, however. Each completed chapter brought her great relief at its delivery. Quote, it enters into my very soul, she revealed in her diary, to write those things no one knows, save only those whose hearts are interwoven with its themes. How much one suffers, she continued, in writing for the public 
the innermost feelings of the soul. The story of Hepzibah might read as the product of the author's fancy, were it not so true to reality. Beginning with her birth in rural Massachusetts on February 29, 1828, an auspicious day auguring an auspicious life, Emmeline Blanche Woodward followed an unusual path for her gender, time, and place. Her quick perception and obvious abilities induced her mother to find the means to educate her to the age of 14, a rare achievement for a rural farm girl. After leaving the New Salem Academy when she completed her studies there, she was given a schoolroom of young scholars to teach and an opportunity to start writing the verses that would one day ripen into mature poetry. When she decided to become a Latter-day Saint with her mother and three younger siblings during her last year of school, her friends and mentors mourned the fate of their talented, intelligent, and ambitious friend and pupil. But their entreaties did not dissuade her, and she was baptized on the day she celebrated her 14th birthday, March 1st, 1842, just 13 days before the organization organization of the Relief Society, which would one day be so central to her life. She married James Harris the next year, and despite the continued protestations of her friends, she migrated to Nauvoo in the spring of 1844 with her new husband, his parents, and his brother. Meeting the prophet Joseph Smith was an electrifying experience for her, which she repeatedly recounted throughout her life. At his death in Carthage, the uncertain future drove Emmeline's parents-in-law to leave Nauvoo and the church, and her husband to travel to St. Louis in search of steady work. He never returned. The death of her son, six weeks after his birth, left her without any family in Nauvoo, and she despaired of the future. When will sorrow ever leave my bosom, she lamented. Here am I, brought to this great city by one to whom I ever expected to look for protection and left dependent on the mercy and friendship of strangers. Must I forever be unhappy? Her choice to remain with the church led to marriage with Newell K. Whitney, a well-loved bishop and devoted follower of Joseph Smith. This marriage gave her a loving family and the security she had lost when James had left. It also gave her eventually two daughters. But this marriage, too, was to end abruptly. Whitney's unexpected death in Salt Lake City in 1850, only weeks after the birth of her second child, left her once again on her own, until rescued a second time two years later when she married Daniel H. Wells, a close friend of the Whitney's. Three Wells daughters joined her Whitney children in a close family relationship. Unfortunately, the story of Hepzibah ends as Emmeline leaves Nauvoo with the Whitney's. But in its conclusion, Emmeline informs her readers that the, quote, startling facts which she had presented along with a vivid imagination should, should be enough for those readers to conjecture a sequel and settle Hepzibah's future as they might think appropriate from the testimony given. But the facts that followed were startling enough that little inventiveness was required to produce a sequel to match Hepzibah. When her five daughters had grown into young women, Emmeline took her first step into the public realm hardly aware of the significant part she was about to play in the history of the church. It began when she submitted her first article to the woman's exponent. Little did she know then that this new local publication would become her passport to the world of public activism and connect her in a satisfying and challenging collegiality, not only with other journalists through a practice of newspaper exchanges, but with leaders of national women's organizations who came to know her through this semi-monthly paper. To counter the stream of ridicule LDS women experienced, Emmeline wrote detailed editorials in The Exponent and articles for other women's papers, 
providing glimpses into Mormon society, lauding the achievements of LDS youth, commending the enterprising work of the women's organizations, and touting the high moral character of LDS women. As an LDS representative, Emmeline eventually became an active member and officer of the National Women's Suffrage Association, the National and International Councils of Women, and a variety of professional women's organizations. Using these resources, Emmeline found opportunities to bring her Mormon sisters into amicable relations with the women of the world who had for so long disdained their religion and its practices. That Mormon women had been voting citizens since 1870 opened another door for her bridge building. Under Emmeline's encouragement, many of them joined the suffrage movement, and in 1877, Emmeline was able to send a thousand signatures to the National Women's Suffrage Association supporting a constitutional amendment for universal woman suffrage. In a letter that accompanied the signatures, Emmeline wrote, the women of Utah desire to be one with the women of America in this grand movement. Her reuniting efforts bore fruit when LDS women were invited to attend the 1879 annual convention of the National Women's Suffrage Association. Emmeline was delighted to be one of the representatives along with Zina Young Williams and meet the women with whom she had corresponded for several years. The trip to Washington turned out to be a nostalgic journey for her as she traveled eastward along the route she had walked 31 years before. Our feelings in recalling these scenes, she wrote, can only be appreciated by those who shared the same perils. She must have compared the speed and comfort of her Pullman train with the slow and laborious travel of the ox cart that had brought her to Utah so long before. Indelibly impressed on her was the trek across Iowa in the company of Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, and other church leaders, a heady experience for the young convert. With a two-year layover in winter quarters, she did not arrive in the Salt Lake Valley until the fall of 1848, just a few weeks before giving birth to her first Whitney daughter in the wagon that had been her home for three months. She often recalled the events of that cold November night. Emmeline and Zina had left Salt Lake City amidst the demeaning name-calling of the anti-Mormon Salt Lake Tribune and a full measure of their own trepidation but they were warmly welcomed by Susan B. Anthony and other suffrage leaders and unexpectedly selected to assist in presenting the convention's memorial to President Rutherford, Rutherford Hayes, soliciting his support of a constitutional amendment granting women the vote. But the two women were in Washington to fulfill another more significant mission. Hoping to forestall legislation that would be injurious to plural families, they had a private interview of their own with President Hayes. Then they lobbied senators and congressmen and made a special appeal to the House Judiciary Committee. The success of these efforts became evident when the Edmonds Act was passed two years later, which did indeed protect some of the inheritance rights of plural wives and their children, while removing the voting rights of all those involved in plural marriage. During her month away, the relationships Emmeline forged with many of the prominent national women's leaders remained lifelong and led years later to their support in retaining Mormon women's membership in their organizations, despite the lingering objections of some of the other members. When she returned from this initial foray into national politics, Emmeline enthousi enthusiastically exclaimed to her diary, I thank God I was the first to represent our women in the halls of Congress. Between her visits to Washington, D.C., Emmeline maintained a constant flow of correspondence with the women she had met in 1879 or through her association with national women's papers. Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and the subsequent presidents of the Suffrage Association, as well as officers of other national women's groups, were recipients of this stream of letters. 
and they responded in kind. The long list of names and addresses at the end of each of Emmeline's diaries reveals not only the number, but the wide range of women and men with whom she corresponded. Neither time nor distance could diminish the depth of her friendship with the many acquaintances she made during her long years of public work. One of her valued gifts was a gold ring given to her by Susan B. Anthony as a token, token of their enduring friendship. Ever ecumenical in her own approach to life, she worried about the self-satisfied parochialism she often saw around her. A continued association with these national organizations seemed to her a vital step in overcoming the prejudice against her Mormon sisters and giving them the respected place they deserved within the community of American women. If the sisters in general could have these matters explained to them, she lamented to her diary, they would realize the importance of the connection that brought the women of Zion into such close relationship with the most famous and best educated women of the day. The increase of love toward one another through these united efforts, she wrote, is one of the most hopeful signs of the age. It proves conclusively that there is a power and influence binding women together such as has not been heretofore. For Emmeline, that power came from the prophet Joseph's words to the Relief Society in Nauvoo when he turned the key that opened doors of knowledge, intelligence, and better days. One of the grand celebrations of the 19th century, the 1893 Columbian Exposition held in Chicago, proved to Emmeline Wells what a united sisterhood could produce. The exposition was planned to showcase the developments that had been achieved in all areas of human endeavor. For display in the Women's Building, women throughout the country were invited to send samples of their artistic accomplishments, their handicraft, and their industry, and reports of their community activities. Only a united effort in every locality could bring the desired result. After years of opposition, Emmeline heralded this opportunity to bring Mormon and Gentile women together in preparation for what she proudly called Utah women's contribution to the exposition. This work, she said, is bringing women into a nearness of contact that will increase confidence and a more universal sisterhood will be established by the association and relations of this vast army of workers. At the International Women's Congress held during the exposition, Emmeline and several of her co-workers were among the representative women from around the world who delivered papers. She was also invited to preside over the General Congress held in the Art Palace's Hall of Columbus, an honor she noted never before accorded to a Mormon woman. Then she wryly added, if one of our brethren had such a distinguished honor conferred upon him, it would have been heralded the country over and thought a great achievement. <laughs> a happy consequence of this newfound unity among Utah women occurred a few months after the close of the exposition. Emmeline and a number of her friends were invited to lunch at the Ladies Literary Club in Salt Lake City, and a literary association of non-Mormon women. Her friend and fellow exposition worker, Margaret Salisbury, a member of the club, was their hostess. Some years ago, Emmeline mused to her diary, no Mormon woman could be admitted as visitors even. But now things are different. We are sought after. We are getting more recognition and stand more on an equality with other women than formerly. The highlight of her work with the Councils of Women came in 1899 when she attended the second quinquennial meeting of the International Council held in London in company with a number of other LDS women. As an officer of the National Council, she had opportunity to attend the planning meetings before and during the convention and to meet many of the international delegates, some of whom became lifelong friends and correspondents. She was also invited in a uh, to respond in a session presided over by the famed socialist reformer, Beatrice Webb. There, Emmeline proudly declared, I had the opportunity to speak out, 
to explain our Relief Society fully, its date of organization, its thorough practical work, its halls and buildings in that and other countries, and its practical work for those needing assistance. This Grand Congress of Women was brought to a close with an invitation from Queen Victoria herself to visit Windsor Castle. Before entering the majestic St. George's Hall, where a delicious tea awaited the visitors, the guests lined both sides of the driveway where they received the Queen's wave of greeting as she slowly rode by in her carriage. It was a fitting close to the great international gathering of women, Emmeline observed. If the breadth and intensity of this world's Congress of Women stimulated and engaged Emmeline's mind and professional interests, London touched her cultural and aesthetic sensitivities. A few years ago, with her diary in hand, I relived that wondrous visit with her. It was as though we traveled together as I saw that historic city through her eyes. We relished together our first glimpse of the magnificent Houses of Parliament in Westminster Abbey. One of the dreams of my life had been to see these historic places, she effused, and be able to stand in such consecrated ground and view the ancient architectural grandeur, grandeur as well as the sculpture and Arabic and other inscriptions and ornamentation. To one so full of sentiment and romance, the whole situation was most truly overwhelming and aroused all the sensibilities that find expression in emotional feeling. She spoke for both of us. Afterwards, we strolled through the National Gallery and I noted the paintings that particularly moved her. I accompanied her to Hyde Park to hear the itinerant preachers and wandered with her through the streets of London. Feeling the heartbeat of the city where its distant past intersected with the teeming and vibrant present, its architectural dignity, its historical monuments, which any school child would recognize, the Dickensian squalor that still blighted some of its streets, and the quaint tea shops that offered stimulating conversation with newly made friends, all entranced us both. I shared her interest in visiting the London bookshops, which gave both of us hours of delight with their enticing titles and promise of splendid hours of reading. Emmeline could not leave England without paying homage to two authors whom she highly regarded. I did not know Marie Corelli, a popular 19th century novelist who entertained Emmeline and invited her to stay overnight in her Stratford-upon-Avon cottage. Emmeline was delighted to sleep in the room where Corelli had written The Sorrows of Satan and was then writing two more books. Some of Corelli's religious ideas expressed in The Sorrows of Satan corresponded with Emmeline's own religious views, which made that book a particular favorite. Of more interest to me was her visit to Number 4 Chain Walk in Chelsea, a suburb of London, where we visited the home of Mary Ann Evans, better known as George Eliot. She had died more than a decade earlier, and the present owner of the house allowed us only a brief glimpse through its front hallway. But Emmeline would be pleased to know that the home now bears a beautiful bronze plaque with George Eliot's name and dates inscribed. That Emmeline did the temple work for George Eliot seems a natural consequence of her high regard of this author. This two months long overseas excursion, which included visits to Scotland and France, had been both a private and professional venture of extraordinary meaning and value. The great international gathering had been a fulfillment of Emmeline's faith in women's united work and her hope of bringing acceptance to her Mormon sisters. Some years later, in a visit to Salt Lake City, May Wright Sewell, a former president of both the National and International Councils of Women, identified her longtime friend Emmeline as one, quote, who had done much to create the good feelings now existing toward LDS women. President Wells, she said, was the connection between the women of the council and the women of her church. What stirring events have transpired during the last few years, Emmeline mused to her diary during the voyage home. What further changes are yet to come, I know not. Twenty more years of active service 
with many unexpected opportunities, yet awaited the 71-year-old Emmeline, including an 11-year association with the Relief Society as its general president, ending just three weeks before her death at age 93. This final service for women, she felt, was the crowning point of her life's work. One might conclude that Emmeline Wells had little time to give to family in the whirlwind life she lived. Her letters and diaries prove otherwise. She kept far-flung relatives close to their family roots by her incessant letter writing, and her diaries are populated with family, the Woodwards, the Whitneys, the Wells. The same compelling drive to bring her Mormon sisters into congenial relations with other women manifest itself in her association with her large extended families. Her acclaimed memory is evident as she notes anniversaries of their births, marriages, and deaths long after they have died, making her diaries veritable genealogical records. When Emmeline left her Massachusetts home in 1844, she little imagined that 40 years would pass before she returned. She had been the first of the Woodward children to leave New England, followed two years later by her mother and three younger siblings, all hoping to settle permanently in Nauvoo. Though her mother died in the exodus from Nauvoo, the three younger children continued on to Utah with Emmeline. But there were three married sisters and two brothers still in New England, and Emmeline yearned to reunite with them. Her account of her 1885 visit comprises one of the more informative and delightful of all her diaries. It is truly a journey of rediscovery for her, a reconnecting with times and people and events long past, but ever vivid in her memory and the frequent subject of many of her poems and articles. Again, with her, guide, with her diary as our guide, I joined her and her sister Pallas as she reviewed the scenes of a happy childhood. We toured the beautiful countryside of Petersham, North New Salem, and Orange, Massachusetts, in Pallas's open carriage with a square fringe top and one stout horse to pull it. She showed me the North Pond where she skated in winter on our way to the heart of the village where we stopped at the quaint old North New Salem Church in which the minister, Erastus Curtis, held forth every Sunday. Everyone knew, Emmeline reminded us, that his wife, Deborah, wrote his sermons and were not a bit surprised that he resigned when she died. <laughs> One day we visited old Mrs. Lucy Harris Blackington, James's mother, who had returned to Massachusetts after leaving the church and remarrying following the death of her husband. Emmeline went alone to her house. There she confronted the 90-year-old woman who had treated her so cruelly, Emmeline recalled, during her brief marriage to her son, about which the forthright Emmeline reminded her. They parted amicably, however. Emmeline bought Lucy's picture, a custom of the time, and left her with copies of the woman's exponent. Most impressive of this long nostalgic journey was a visit to the old homestead, now a desolate and deserted place, but full of memories of a large, bustling, and happy family. Nearby was the little brook where Emmeline's sister Delia said she got her inspiration to write, but was more memorable for the events of March 1, 1842. On that day, Emmeline remembered, eight of us went down into the waters of baptism, the ice being cut for our benefit. Much excitement prevailed, she recalled. Threats by town authorities and ministers, judges, and others came to the water's edge to forbid the baptism or to learn if she was submitting to it of her own free will and choice. It was a trying ordeal, Emmeline wrote, but the crisis passed and she resolved at that early age to dedicate her life to the work of the church. With visits to other family members and friends, Emmeline spent an emotional, nostalgic month with a family once more bound closely together by her presence. Her relationship with her three husbands reveals a similar urge to remain connected to three men 
she loved in very different ways. In an era when the rationale for denying women equal opportunities with men was that men would be their providers and protectors, many women like Emmeline did not always enjoy that umbrella of care. Deserted by her first husband, widowed at age 22 by her second, and isolated by the benign neglect of her third, Emmeline learned the value of self-reliance. I am determined to train my daughters, she told her diary, to habits of independence so that they never need to trust blindly, but understand for themselves and have sufficient energy of purpose to carry out plans for their own welfare and happiness. But these marital disappointments found resolutions that dispelled lingering sorrows and separations. James, the love of her youth and father of her only son, went to sea after leaving Nauvoo. Fifteen years later, she learned he had died at sea near Bombay, India. But there was an epilogue to that tragic story. In 1893, 50 years after she and James had married, a cousin sent her a bundle of letters, all written by James to her by way of his mother. He had written me in all the confidence of boyish love, Emmeline wrote, but she had never received those missives. His mother kept them while she lived, Emmeline lamented. Notwithstanding I visited her, she did not give them up. But she greeted this belated news with both dismay and delight, which she expressed in verse. Could she forgive the injury now that she knew the story of her wrong, alas, too late. He loved her always, and he had been constant, too. This was some compensation for her fate. A sorrowful chapter in her eventful life was at last laid to rest. She had not been forgotten. Her five-year marriage to Newell K. Whitney came as a rescue mission a few months after James's departure from Nauvoo. More than husband to me, she wrote, this grand patriarch, as she finally, fondly referred to him, became her spiritual anchor and the pivotal figure in her life at a time when she had little ballast or direction. She noted in her diary virtually every anniversary of his birth, and nearly 50 years after his death, he was still a presence in her life. On that occasion, she remembered him as, quote, a great man with an analytical mind, ready to explain in the finest degree principles and to substantiate truths in the same way. There are few men in the world like him, she wrote, upright, honest, chase. She would not forget him. Despite her brief marriage to Newell K. Whitney and much longer marriage to Daniel H. Wells, she nurtured her relationship with the Whitneys and they remained her first family. That both families made claim to her is evident in a poem recited at one of her birthdays by Horace Whitney. Proud Wellses, though you claim and am, your title is the worst. Your mortgage is a second one. The Whitneys hold the first. <laughs> <laughs> so while we're willing, you, shall, you should share our claim and won't oppose it. Please keep that mortgage well in mind, lest someday we foreclose it. <laughs> Not to be outdone, Rulin Wells, very impromptu, responded. The Whitneys claim a prior right and threaten to foreclose. The adjudication of this case will leave to him who knows. But this I know and do maintain that you are ours pro tem, and in the great eternity you'll always be and am. <laughs> Only the first 20 of the 40 years Emmeline was married to Daniel H. Wells gave her the security and companionship which had been cut so short in her previous marriages. First, his numerous civic positions, then his calling as a counselor to Brigham Young, later his service as president of the European Mission, and upon his return in 1887, his calling as president of the Manti Temple, siphoned away the time he could spend with any member of his extensive family. The frenetic work that filled Emmeline's days helped to compensate for this unavoidable neglect and brought her a different kind of companionship and satisfaction. 
It was entirely unexpected, therefore, when he urged her to visit him in Manti, given the emotional and physical distance that had defined their relationship for nearly two decades. By then, he was 76 and she was 62. Strange indeed, she wrote of their reunion, that after all my younger years have been passed in comparative seclusion, that when I am past three score even, he should seem so devoted. For more than a year, they visited together frequently in his apartment in the Manti Temple and in her home in Salt Lake City. Their renewed relationship stirred long dormant feelings in Emmeline, and she came to miss him deeply after, the, after their brief visits. In January of 1891, after a few days together, she lamented that, quote, although he is almost always away, yet when he leaves, all the first few days seem weariness. We so enjoyed the visit and promised ourselves many more such good visits. But there would be no more. He died two months later. She poignantly summarized the essence of their life together. Now, only memories, she wrote only the coming and the going and the parting at the door. The joy when he came, the sorrow when he went. She would carry the memory of these reconciliations for the 30 more years that were left to, left to her as three times a widow. The deaths of three children, two daughters died as young women, and many grandchildren added to the burden of loss and loneliness Emmeline quietly bore. But she was yet able to say, through trials that would pierce the inmost recesses of the human heart, I have risen triumphant. This self-evaluation midway through her life was a liberating realization that empowered her to give 40 more years of service toward enabling other women to feel the same. Shakespeare, in one of his lovely sonnets to his unnamed love, asserted that not marble nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme, but you shall shine more bright in these contents than unswept stone besmeared with sluttish time. A similar, though less poetic, reference was made to Emmeline at her death in April 1921. No need of a storied urn or marble bust to perpetuate her memory, the news article stated, and M needs no monument beyond the record of her own lovely life and her unselfish labor. Yet such a monument was sculpted by Cyrus Dallin and presented by all the women of Utah to the state in 1928, the centenary of Emmeline's birth. It was inscribed simply but profoundly, a fine soul who served us. Like the contents of Shakespeare's poem, her own words are the most telling record of this woman's life. Even more, they offer a view to a forgotten period in the history of Latter-day Saint women, a history she helped make as well as preserve. In a confessional letter to a good friend, she reflected on the commitment that had been her lodestar. When I am gone, she wrote, the work will all be done by other hands, perhaps even better than mine has been done. I have not followed anyone else, but I hope I have kept within the radius of the true light. It is hoped that the light that guided her will be bright enough to illuminate the written life of this intriguing woman and the complex world in which she lived. Thank you.